Thanks, everyone. So firstly, we just want to give a huge thanks to Graham and Ashcon because, uh, you know, they're just so awesome. From building a great float center at Float On that really embodies the spirit of this industry to, uh, you know, starting the apprenticeship program that starts so many people on their journey to opening a center, uh, as we did, to creating the helm, to uh, bring everyone together here at the conference. It's just they're totally leaders by example in the truest sense of that term. So thank you guys for existing. And uh, a genuine thank you to everyone here. Um, it's always, you know, every day we get up and we're thankful to be part of this industry. It's so unique. Everyone's just so appreciative of teamwork and collaboration. So with that, we'd like to, to share a little bit with you uh, about how we keep our tanks full. Perfect. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, so who are we? Uh, like Ashkan said, some of you know us. I'm sure a lot of you don't know us. Um, this is Sean. My name is Jesse. And we are from Float Toronto. Um, our story is a lot like some of yours. Uh, we discovered floating about six years ago. And like many of you, something just clicked. Uh, we eventually began cultivating a vision for our own center that we would one day open. At the time, we had jobs that weren't totally fulfilling. And it was our constant reminders to each other that we still have an open to float center. <laughs> that eventually accelerated the dream into a reality. So we've been open for about two years now, and we've hosted over 25,000 floats, and we have just over 300 members to go along with our five float tanks. Um, So being asked to come up here and speak about our experiences is extremely humbling. Um, sitting down and reflecting on all of the different ways we've built momentum around the center has really been a great exercise for us. It's given us an opportunity to really solidify and reinforce all of the things that we've done, that we've done right uh, in our mind and things that have really brought the center to life. So these are the things that have worked for us. Um, I'm sure every center operator in here has several techniques and strategies that uh, keep new floaters coming in. And we learned a ton of things from the centers that opened up before us. So we definitely encourage you to do the same. Talk to as many people as you can, see what jives with you, and then uh, really like, mix your own ideas into the mix. So keeping the tanks full. How to attract and maintain a steady stream of buoyant bodies. This is really the key right here, keeping the tanks full. An empty tank is a lonely tank. Once you get someone to the center, the float and the experience that you've created around the shop will speak for itself, and people will become regular floaters. The regular floaters then become part of your marketing team as they spread the word. And if they're really good at spreading the word, you might decide to bring them onto the team and make them an ambassador. And I'll touch more on that in a second. So we believe that keeping the tanks full is a result of us harnessing our passion for floating and focusing our marketing strategies on the demographics who are most likely to also enjoy the experience. So we focus most of our energy on people who have a perceived interest in floating or a similar interest, instead of focusing on a more general public audience. So here are some of the ways that we attract new clients. Free floats. Giving out a free float is an amazing way to introduce someone to the float tank, and we encourage you to be more liberal than you probably are thinking when it comes to giving them out. We don't mean walking down the street and flagging people down. We mean mindfully giving floats to people you connect with who seem genuinely interested in the experience. It introduces people to floating, someone who might not have scheduled a float on their own. So many times we've had people say to us how much they love their float and that they probably wouldn't have come in if it hadn't been for the free float. Many of these people have gone on to become regular floaters. This is what I meant by perceived interest. You meet someone, you talk about floating, you see that they're interested, and then you can remove all possible barriers to entry by simply giving them a float. Then they come in, and now you have a new floater. It starts a ripple effect of awareness. So between word of mouth and social media, the ripple effect is vast. When someone floats, you're not making one person aware of floaters. You're, making, you're starting a chain reaction of awareness that stretches beyond measure, all from simply giving out a float. It's easy. You can prepare floats to go along with your brochure and keep them with you, or your software system might have some form of instant capability, like the Helm bot, a feature made available through the Helm, which we use, and it is the best. It allows us to send a float directly to someone from our phones to their email on the spot, 
So you don't have to remember anyone's email address. They don't have to remember what your name was or how to contact you. They're going to open up their email. They're going to see the float. And they can book it right then. It's an awesome thing to do. It's a great tool to have in your pocket. You're going to make someone's day, and you're also making a great first impression as someone who really stands behind their business. For your staff and your ambassadors, it's empowering to be able to hand out floats when they're out and about and floating comes up. Keeping the tanks full was one of the first things that Graham and Ashcon told us when we were opening, and we really took it to heart. Giving out floats is definitely part of the puzzle. Your community. The momentum of our center developed in harmony with the community that surrounds it. Our staff, our ambassadors, our close friends in the neighborhood, along with our regular floaters, have become the identity of the shop. The center has become a social hub where like-minded people are connecting. The community surrounding the center is what people will see when they come in. It's part of what will keep them coming back. Be it to connect with a certain staff member again, to continue an interesting conversation, or to learn more about float tanks. Here are some ways we've created a community around the center. We, have a, we keep a pamphlet on the storefront with a little sign over it that says, what is floating? This way, when anyone walks by who's wondering what's going on inside, can simply grab it and have all of their questions answered without having to walk into the shop. It also saves your staff from having to answer all of the initial questions that most people have about floating. The pamphlet is a great thing to get into someone's hands, probably the best thing, actually, because it actually explains the whole experience in detail, and then they can show all their friends and family and not worry about remembering all the procedures and the benefits. We have an energy exchange. So we do a weekly deep clean and a maintenance day where we have a mixture of staff and volunteers that come in and help us prepare the center for the week. And the volunteers get to learn more about floating in exchange for a free float. We get some help around the shop. The whole program serves as a sort of pool for hiring when needed. And as the cherry on top, the whole deep clean scenario creates a social buzz that is based around floating, which is definitely a plus. We have staff who love floating, and they float often. So your staff will automatically become your first line of ambassadors, both in and out of the shop. If your staff don't love floating, how are they going to be able to convince new customers to give it a shot as well? In terms of our ambassadors, this is something that we let happen really organically. So they are in basically enthusiastic floaters who became our friends. And they are people who, we feel com who, who really feel compelled to spread the word without having to be asked. So they believe in the cause, and, and we sort of recognize this. And certain people who are especially in like other social realms who you know, may come into contact with people who we won't, now they have the ability to give out a float, spread the word. And uh, it's something that's been hugely helpful for us. So all of our staff and our ambassadors are all set up on the Helmbot to give away floats at their discretion. So we have approximately 20 people out there, out and about in the city, who at any given moment in time can meet someone, give them a float, send them into the center for their first experience. So up here we have uh, some ambassadors and some staff members. Partnerships. So these are some businesses that we've collaborated with. And associating ourselves with other reputable establishments in the city has proven to be extremely helpful. So they're not just other businesses. These are other social hubs for like-minded people. So each one is a portal which leads to the float. Um, some of these partnerships are sort of formal and others aren't. Um, all of these relationships developed in a very organic way that centers around a healthy lifestyle and a love for floating. So we have some reciprocal benefits between us and the juice bar across the street. Our pamphlets can be found sitting in some of these places. Some of the people who own these places are activated on the Helmbot to give away floats. And some of them offer discounts to their clients. Floating in the media. Although floating is still fairly niche, it is unquestionably bursting into the mainstream in many capacities. Many influential people have taken up the practice, and it's also starting to make its way into movies and television. So here are some of the more notable appearances of float tanks in the, online and in the media. Of course, we have Rogan, popular Simpsons episode where Lisa and Homer go for a float. Uh, there was a documentary on Vice that got a lot of attention. And my personal favorite was uh, when the MVP of the NBA, Steph Curry, came out as a floater earlier this year. <laughs> and here's one of the more recent uh, appearances of float tanks in the media. And I know what you're thinking. Not quite as sexy as Dr. Feinstein's circular tank. <laughs> Still pretty cool, though. And uh, one of our good friends is actually a film producer who's just about to start a fairly large production 
on a film involving float tanks, which is really cool. So we'll definitely share that with everybody. And uh, just wanted to point out with these bigger media outlets that um, the appearance of floating in these bigger media outlets really lets us know that we all are definitely working together. Because as you know, when some, someone becomes interested in floating, the first thing they're going to do is go online, check out where the nearest float tank is to them, and go in for their first float. So it's another reminder of how we're working together. So when Ashcon first asked us to give a talk on, on our marketing strategies here, I'll admit we had some mixed feelings. It, not because of the time and effort it was going to take to prepare this, but just because I felt like it was going to be a bit awkward to get up in front of this crowd and, and talk about marketing. There's no way around it. It's, it's an inherently tricky subject for our industry. Um, you know, we're all bombarded with ads every day. And in a way, what everyone in this room is trying to do is offer an escape from that noise. So naturally, it can feel a bit counterintuitive to actively contribute to it. Um, but the reality is that we collectively as an industry and individually as small businesses are competing every day for people's time, attention, and ultimately their money with other things that are inevitably probably less good for them. And in a sense, our marketing is actually analogous to the service we offer. While uh, floating offers some yin to the yang of busy, overstimulated lives, float center marketing naturally advocates taking a break, you know, embracing silence, specifically seeking less stimulation. And in this sense, it, it provides some yin to the dominant yang in the world of advertising. Now, the good news is that there's never been a better time to be a small business specifically when it comes to marketing. Um, think of it this way. So with traditional forms of marketing like TV, radio, newspaper, giant corporations like, say, Nike, GM, Verizon, et cetera, whose audience is just everybody, they're happy to pay to reach everybody. But for a small business in a city, say, like Portland, of three million people, it's probably only worthwhile to reach the 100,000 or so people who are close by. In this broad, hypothetical, and, and probably exaggerated example, the advertising dollar of this big company is about 30 times more valuable than the small business. But with, uh, with new types of online advertising, <clears throat> uh, the advantage has shifted a bit, or we can at least say that the playing field has been leveled. Um, for example, with Google AdWords, you can advertise specifically to those people who are searching for floating. Um, you, with Google re-advertising, you can advertise to those people who have visited your site in the last week or month. And with Facebook and Instagram, we can narrow down that audience from a full city to those living within one or two miles who have interests that are specifically aligned with floating, like say yoga or meditation, etc. So this is essentially what we've done. We've narrowed down the population of Toronto from six million people to the 70,000 or so who are most likely coming to the business, those who are located really close to us and who have kind of like-minded interests. And uh, <clears throat> that has really been working for us. Our, our advertising budget typically ranges around three to $4,000 a month. Um, it's weighted heavily towards social media. Um, on the podcast before the conference, Ashcon asked a really good question. He said, how do you know this is working for you? And, and the answer to that question isn't really ideal. The truth is that our methods of advertising, you know, they're, they're very passive. They're not, we don't track our ROI to the penny. We don't know exactly which customers are coming from where. We don't, uh, you know, we know some are coming from Google, some are coming from Facebook, some are coming from free float, some are coming from word of mouth. Um, but what we can say is that when we first open, we were totally tapped, as probably everyone else was when they opened. Um, and so we had no money for marketing, and we were sitting at about 50% occupancy, and we were just kind of pulling in anyone we could, giving away as many free floats as we could. And after the first month, we kind of broke even, and the second month, we had a little bit of profit. We reinvested in advertising. The next month, there was a tiny bit more, and we re reinvested that in advertising again. And basically, it progressed like that for three or four months until we were basically fully booked and, and have been uh, ever since. So <clears throat> I'm just going to walk you through for a minute quickly about exactly kind of 
how we go through our, our ad, designing our ad campaigns. So when it comes to actually creating ad content, before explaining what we do, I just want to say that it mostly comes from a book called The Human Brand. And my best piece of advice would just be to read that book. Uh, it articulates these ideas better than I will. But uh, the central idea is that humans have evolved to make staff judgments um, based on trust. And whether or not we can trust someone, or for this conversation, a business, is broken down to two main judgments. The first is they call warmth, which signals good intention. And the second is called competence or credibility, which signals your ability to execute on that intention. So these kind of oppose with obviously coldness and incompetence. So for, all, for us, all of our content curation is done with these two kind of ideas of warmth and competence in mind. For example, we'll pay a few hundred dollars to share an article that just advocates taking a walk in the forest. And that's kind of our way of saying, you know, we're not just trying to take your money and get you in the float tank. We genuinely just want to make your life better. And then conversely, to, to just try to display competence, we'll share testimonials or, or share research or things like that. And one added benefit we find that we've kind of noticed um, is that by committing to authenticity in this type of marketing, it actually creates this positive feedback loop where mindful focus on warmth and competence in marketing actually ends up leading us to be more well-intentioned and really striving to act more competently in day-to-day -day operations at the center. So <clears throat> next up, I just want to, once you've kind of created your content, walk you through how we create our ad campaigns. There's two kind of ideas, concentration and repetition, um, that allows us to kind of get our message through. Concentrating your audience, we're kind of guided by this, this one quote. Would you rather convince 100% of the people 10% of the way, or 10% of the people all the way? This is, of course, a simplification, but the idea, it's really guided us. <clears throat> In advertising, there's something called the rule of seven, and the idea behind that is that you need to reach someone roughly seven times before convincing them to come in and try out your business. Now, this idea first came about maybe 40 or 50 years ago in a very different world where we were hit with about 500 ads a day. And some estimates have that number now at about 5,000. So all this to say that it's likely that repetition is even more necessary now than it ever has been before. So rather than try to reach all of Toronto, we've narrowed down that audience as tight as we can and we try to advertise to those people regularly, roughly about once a week. Um, and one thing I just wanted to add in before I finish here is it's something that Jim Hefner brought up this morning. I feel like sometimes in an industry, we have this, like, don't get me wrong, I'm not uh, too naive to, um, like we understand that competition is important and that, and that it breeds you know, progress to some extent, but it's a bit unnecessary at this moment in our industry. We kind of trick ourselves into thinking that if another center opens in the area, and I know we were guilty of this in, in the early days of our center, um, into thinking that there's a fixed number of floaters out there that we're all competing for. Uh, the reality is that such a small portion of the population is even aware of what floating is at this point. And the market's going to grow as awareness grows. So it's kind of all of our responsibility as float center owners to spread the word about floating. So with that, we'll just kind of recap. Give away as many floats as you can. Establish a community of passionate people who are kind of naturally attracted to your business. Embrace those people that come to you. And then just spend as much time, energy, and, and money if you have it spreading the word online. So thank you guys.